Uh, hey everyone, how's it going? Welcome to whatever this is. Um, you see, I was getting ready to record the next Final Fantasy IX episode in which we are going uh, back to Trino to participate in the Tetra Master tournament. And I decided, you know, I don't really remember how to play Tetra Master. <laughs> and soon discovered that there's no way I ever knew how to play Tetra Master. I know I did play it when I was a kid. I know I have played it in the game, but I, I, I also probably won a few games by accident. I definitely did not know how to play it or what this game even is. Uh, and I, so I, I went to the wiki just to read up, to brush up, to refresh myself. Um, and I found a hole. I found fell into a Tetra Master hole, and all I know is that I've I've crawled out of it knowing less, um, knowing that, that Tetra Master is some kind of incomprehensible arcane beast, and to prove that, um, instead of playing any Final Fantasy IX today at all, um, I'm just gonna read out the wiki because I could talk to you about Tetra Master. I could try to, in my own words, do justice to how utterly baffling this game is, but I'm going to give you the experience that I just had, and I think that's the most authentic way uh, uh, to convey what I feel right now. So we're going to, we're just going to skip this prelude here. Um, and we're going to get into the game structure. So, Tetra Master is played between two players on a 4x4 four four square grid of blank spaces. 4x4 four four square grid. Okay, great. Uh, where cards are placed as the game progresses. Cards are pictured with various characters, monsters, or other items, mainly from Final Fantasy IX. Cool, cool, we know that. We got, we got like, the, the Rama card, the Shiva card. We know that there's monsters and Eidolons and stuff on them. Uh, so they're they're familiar to the player. Each card features four values written across the card. Mave arrows along the sides or in the corners. The following image is an, uh, is an example. Uh, so far, so good. Cards have values on them uh, and arrows and shit. Whatever. Fine. Great. This one has two arrows uh, left and right. And it says three? That looks like a P. Yeah, that looks like a P. All right. Six and then either an O or a zero. It could be either one. Let's just assume 3P60. We'll discover what these goddamn numbers mean in a bit. Or maybe we just won't. The basis of the game is for cards on the grid to challenge, sorry, adjacent cards whereby the values written on the card are assessed to decide the winner. Okay, that's a roundabout way of saying you decide who wins the card battle between the two cards that you place down based on the numbers that are on the card. Cool. That's how you would expect it to work so far. Oh, let's break down these card values, though. Every card has four values or stats. In the example card above, the card has the stats 3P60. Each stat relates to the card's strength. The second value, P, is always an alphabetical value, while the other three stats increase on a hexadecimal range, meaning they can range from 0 to 9 and then through uh, uh, the letters A through F. The first value is for the power of the card, 3 above. Okay. 3 above what? That's... Okay. Sure. That's the card's power. The second value is the battle class. P above. Sorry? I'm sorry? The third value is for the physical defense of the card. Six above. The fourth value is for the magical defense of the card. Zero above. <laughs> Each of the stats for power, physical defense, and magical defense increase on a hexadecimal scale, with zero being the weakest, F being the strongest. Each of the stats represents a range of possible hit points. Okay. So, um, if, if the value on the card is zero, it means that that value represents zero to 15 or anywhere in between 
hit points. Uh, and then the range from for F, which is the highest, uh, is 240 to 255. Okay. Whenever a card's value is assessed, a random value is chosen between the minimum and maximum numbers. When is it assessed? Okay, whatever. We'll, we might get to that. Uh, and it corresponds to the value. For example, if a card is a value of A, the strength of that value may be between 160 and 175. The minimum for a card's value is calculated by multiplying the base value to be considered by 16. Huh? For example, 16 times A, 10, is 160. How does... Okay, I guess that's just assuming that the whatever it whatever range it falls. Wait, no, what? No, what? Why is A10 here? So I guess this table is just after they've already been multiplied by 16? No? That doesn't make s Okay, whatever. Okay. So the power stat, the first value on the card is the power stat. This is the card's offensive value. The example card uh, has a power stat of 3, which means its actual value is a number chosen between 48 and 63 HP. Oh my god. The second value on the card is the battle class stat. This value is not based on the hexadecimal scale above, but instead is one of four classes. This stat is represented by the letters P, M, X, and A. P is physical, M is magical, uh, X is flexible. Dot, dot, dot. Uh, A is an assault battle class. Why do we have assault and physical? Overlapping. Whatevs. The card's battle class determines how the values are assessed in card battles. Uh, these all affect which stat the attacking card attacks. P will attack the physical defense stat, while M will attack the magical defense stat. The other two have more obscure effects as they are rarer. X will attack the lowest of the two defenses, and A will attack the lowest value on the card. So, hold on. Okay, great. So we do have the physical and magical defense and all, and the power and all that. So, okay. I had to take a second and make sure I understood what I had read. Because that's not always a given. Okay, so. Battle class stat. Is that the one we just did? Oh boy. Oh boy. Physical defense stat. The third value on the card is the physical defense stat. This is the card's defensive value when facing physical attacks. Uh, the example card has a 6, so this may be equal to anywhere between 96 and 111 HP. Uh, magical defense, same idea. What's the deal with the card arrows? As well as its stat values, each card may have a set of arrows in any of eight directions. These points are usually referred to by using the traditional points on a compass, e.g. north, northwest, west, etc. The card above possesses two arrows at west and east on the card. <laughs> the, ar <laughs> the arrows come into play when cards are in an attack situation. An attack on a card may only be made when an arrow on the challenging card is facing the resting... <sighs> Sorry... When an arrow on the challenging card is facing the resting card on the grid. There is a new term for us. The resting card. Um, there are a few scenarios where the arrows will not affect anything. The first card played will not affect other cards. Okay, that makes perfect sense. There are no other cards to affect. When a card is played next to another card but has no arrows pointing to the opposing card. A card is already on the board. Uh, with an arrow pointing to a square, and a new card is placed in that square, but the new card doesn't have an arrow pointing to the first card. Okay. Okay. Card battles only occur when a card with an arrow is placed facing adjacent to an enemy card with an arrow facing back. Okay. 
I guess. Ooh. Each player has five cards, neither knowing the other's hand. A coin flip decides which of the two players shall begin. Okay, totally fine. Grid blocks. Before the game commences, up to six grid blocks can be placed on the game grid randomly. These will blank that grid square out of gameplay. Blocks simply prevent a card from being placed in its grid square. Any arrow facing a grid block is useless. Okay, that's fine. So you can block out part of the 4x4 grid that you're playing on. And then, a card is played. Once the game is set up, the starting players may play his first card uh, at, any at any unoccupied grid square on the board. After the first card is played, the opposition may play a card, and the game continues with players' turn uh, turns alternating in this fashion. This doesn't really get to the core of why this is so goddamn confusing yet. Uh, neutral card play. If a card is placed in next to another card, they may interact. Should neither of the cards have arrows facing each other, there is no interaction. This is a neutral card play. Hmm? Should the challenging card have an arrow facing a resting card, while the resting card has no arrow facing the opposing direction, the resting card is taken. Now we get to the heart of it. The card battles. Should the challenging card have an arrow facing a resting card, while the resting card has an arrow facing the opposing direction, a card battle takes place. If there are two or more such targets, rest, uh, target resting cards, it falls to the challenger to select which is battled first. This may have consequences for combos. Cards may randomly upgrade their ability... Uh, uh, sorry, how did I read ability there? Cards may randomly upgrade their battle class, a 1 in 64 chance from P or M to X, or 1 in 128 chance from X to A upon winning a card battle. I... don't even... Just take it. Take a moment there. Oh my God, uh, it is in the following situations that the card stats are used. The first two values are used for the challenging card. The last two values are used for the resting card. Uh, and now we describe the different types of battles. A physical battle. If the challenging card has a battle class stat of P. Uh, the power value of this card challenges the physical defense of the resting card. For an example. Uh, see below, challenging card is a 4P51, and the resting card is a 6M05. In the scenario above, the challenging card's power value 4 is assessed against the physical defense of the resting card 0. The challenging card would be a heavy favor to capture the resting card. And that's the same for Magical Flexible Assault. Uh, oh, and then we get to my favorite part. The battle mathematics. When a card battle takes place, the winner is decided upon in three phases. Hmm. Each of the phases are discussed below using the following example. Card A is 5P33, which attacks uh, card B, which I think would be the resting card, right? 2M10. So in phase one, the challenging card's power value is randomly chosen within the stat range, say 85. Uh, stat... Sorry, say... 85. Stat 5 equals between 80 and 85. Okay. The defending card's defense value is randomly chosen within the stat range. The challenging card's battle class is physical, so physical defense is chosen. Uh, say 23. Stat 1 equals between 16 and 31. So the values are being assessed and assigned like on a per card clash or card battle basis it looks like phase two next a random number is chosen between zero and the power value chosen for the challenging card this is the actual attack score say 71 a random number is chosen between zero and the defense value chosen for the defending card 23 this is the actual defense score uh, let's say three phase three <sighs> The scores from Phase 2 are subtracted from the stat values in Phase 1. <laughs> card A, 85 minus 71 is 14. Card B, 23 minus 3 is 20. 
the highest difference uh, wins the card battle. In the scenario above, even card B with low stats was able to defeat card A. What is this? A combo is a series of card takeovers that stem from one. When a card is defeated and captured in battle, any enemy cards pointed out by the arrows of the defeated card are also captured. If the player loses the battle, they also lose control of all their own cards that the attacking card has arrows pointed at. I think I kind of get that. And then this is just a whole bunch of shit about strategies. Oh, winning and losing. Have we not even touched on win conditions yet? The player who controls the most cards when all cards have been placed is declared the winner. Controls the most cards when all... So you play out all your five... All, both players play out their five cards, and then whoever controls the most... It's the same idea as Triple Triad, where you're, you're pitting values of cards against adjacent cards to capture them. But it's it, this just seems like vastly more complex for no reason, and I already kind of hated Triple Triad, uh, mainly because of some of the really dumb rule sets. But oh boy, when a player wins, there's a slight chance a card can upgrade, receiving higher attack power. Oh yeah, there's variants on that, right? Receiving higher attack power. Within limits per card, an X type, uh, if attack type is currently P or M, an A attack uh, type, if attack type is currently X, one higher physical defense within limits per card, or one higher magical defense within limits per card. The maximum number of displayed wins is 9999. After reaching that number, the counter freezes. Collector's level. Oh boy. Look at all this shit. This is, I don't think super important to the actual gameplay of a match of Tetra Master, right? The number of unique cards they own. So that's just some extra bullshit. Oh my god. Yeah, there was an online version. There was a an actual physical version of this. But we've gotten through the part that actually matters, which is that Tetra Master is a nonsense game for, for just lunatics. Oh my god. I really, really must have just played cards at random. Or just played, like, the rarest cards I had and hoped back in the day, because... Y'all, how do you play Tetra Master? How do, you, how do you actually play Tetra Master? Because I did not read this wiki article and come away with an understanding of Tetra Master. <laughs> Just a profound and deep, unfulfilling sense of confusion. How do you, how do you play Tetra Master? Help. I do not understand this. Help. Oh, God. <laughs> and, like, the thing is, this has to just be really poorly explained like this is going into agonizing detail when it probably doesn't need to but I, th I think that the game might also just be ridiculous oh my god thank you all for watching take it easy have a good one next time we'll be back with actual final fantasy 9 gameplay <laughs>